Welcome to the Game Breakers podcast in association with Rhino Rugby League, where we look to bring you tips, insights and experience from the world of sport. My name is Rob Nicolay and as always I'm joined by my co-host Danny Wilson. But today we are joined by former Wakefield Wildcat, York City Knight, Central Queensland Comet, Batley Bulldogs and now current Wakefield Trinity uh, Head of Youth and England Under-16s coach Mark Applegar. Thanks for joining us, Mash. Yeah, thank you, James. How are you both doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah. Good. Cheers, Mark. Thanks for giving up your time. I know time's precious for everyone at the minute and you know, times are tough, but really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to talking to you about some of the hot topics that you deal with daily. Yeah, brilliant. Now, well, first and foremost, I hope, uh, you know, hope you're both safe and well and your families are. It's... Uh, it's mad, isn't it, at the moment? I've never seen anything like it. I don't think many of us. So, yeah, I hope everyone's safe and well. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll let you kick us off today, Danny. Yeah, again, you know, I think it's really interesting to get somebody who's a leader in their field of talent development, which you are, Mark, and you've been involved in that department and as a head of youth for some time now. Obviously, as a, as a player coming through a system yourself, now you're a leader of a, an academy. Have you found anything... If you was to lead yourself as a player, that would have frustrated you now. Uh, yeah, to be fair, I think, I think it's um, you can't really compare the two. Uh, I mean, you're a similar age to me from from when we were coming through. It were very much in its infancy, wasn't it? Our uh, our youth development was uh, perceived, and scholarships were just coming into play. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I definitely frustrate my coaches. I think. I think. Athletically, I think I've been fine. I think uh, I think they've been pretty happy with me. I always, uh, you know, kept on top of my fitness and then my athletic development. Technically, definitely would have frustrated my coach. I could never pass left or right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I'd, I'd always played on left side and I would, uh, right to left, I was fine. But when I tried passing left to right, I could never do it. And my coaches, when I first started playing in uh, in academy at Wakefield, I'm sure I. I must have caused them a few uh, issues, shall we say. I used to make breaks downfield. I had a real simple two-on-one just to release, you know, full-back or whoever was supporting them. Ball of them to pump floor or I'd just fumble it because I couldn't get my, my techniques right and that. So they're definitely frustrated in, um, in that area. Uh, and then mentally probably a bit too. I think it's been real exciting seeing how much the... You know the psychosocial side of it's developed over the last ten years, especially. But I was very much a, a shut up shop. You know, I think that would, you know, probably not a fault of the systems back then, but it was definitely an area you didn't really talk about, wasn't it? And you know, very much stiff up a lip if I if I wasn't happy with something or had issues going on away from rugby, I'd keep it to myself. So I'd have probably been a bit frustrating for my coaches then too if I've had uh, you know something going on elsewhere. Well, like I said, from from that, those experiences as well, what, how how has that formed your um, sort of identity as a coach transitioning into a into a head of youth? And then how how hard has that been that transition? You know, going from a player to a head of youth. Uh, that's a real good question. Actually, I uh, I always knew I wanted to be involved in in you know professional sport after I'd, I'd finished playing. And when I came back from Australia, I think I was about 25, 26, and I just enrolled to start on my degree. Uh, and I met that's when I, I met James Ford properly at Wakefield College and um, himself and another coach called Mick Bamford they were coaching the uh, the Wakefield College development team at the time so I got involved with the coaching there and it were real good to uh, revisit that level so to speak and, and I, I just have a passion for learning and understanding people and um, that helped form my opinion that I wanted to be involved in youth development for the right reasons. I just I didn't want to come back, just serve some time and then go back up into, you know, where you want to be eventually, I suppose, if you do in, in you know, the, the first teams and things like that. It, it's really enjoyable watching kids go from, you know, A to B. You know, everyone's different abilities, different levels. But, you know, if you can watch them develop, it, it's been great. So that's helped. That helped me form, you know, my passion, so to speak, for youth development. And then I knew I could make a change. Uh, I knew that I were in it for the right reasons. And I knew that I could help shape, you know, the future direction of, of youth development, I suppose, in rugby league. So, yeah, it's been a real, real exciting journey in that sense. We've both been privileged to, to work with you uh, in different capacities, Mash. And, I, and I, you touched on there about um, you, how you think you can impact it. You've done a lot of work 
uh, putting your stamp on at Wakefield in the youth department there. And Wakefield produces some good young kids coming through. Can you just talk us through you know, how you've gone about that, um, what your philosophies are, and how your values kind of run through that system at Wakefield now? Yeah, of course I can. Um, you've just hit nail on there that I think Wakefield's uh, you know, a bit of a hotbed uh, for rugby league, especially, you know, we've got enough teams around here, haven't we? And, you know, I know Hull, uh, your club, uh, you've, you've taken some good prospects from Wakefield yourself as of, you know, a lot of other clubs from around here. And, um, you know, the issue that we used to have is I don't think we had the most robust systems in place, uh, which probably led to a bit of an accountability. There wasn't enough accountability, shall we say. So the first thing I did, uh, I mean, Ryan Hudson got me involved when I was still playing, who was the old head of youth. Uh, and I know Raz really well. And um, he had some real good strengths, real people's person and, uh, you know, real good uh, at that side of things. But there were no systems to fall back on. So when he was uh, leaving and that, it was something we were working on in the background. But when I got the opportunity to actually lead the uh, you know, the Wakefield youth system. First thing I did was I went and sat down with the board, especially Michael as, you know, as chairman at the time. Uh, and I just asked him what he wanted, what did he want Wakefield to be known for? Because it's all right, you know, me having my own philosophies and values. Uh, but, you know, it's got to be the clubs. That's got to be the, the main forefront of it is what does the club want to be known for? Because it's all right me developing what I perceive to be, you know, the ideal rugby league player. And then Wakefield Trinity wanting completely something else. It's like I'm developing a person and a product that doesn't fit the hole that I'm trying to push it into. So I just said, what do you want you know, our, our players to be known for that are coming through the system? And then the first thing he did, to be fair to Michael, was he focused on the, the person itself, not the player. And he just said, I want him to be honest. I want him to be hardworking. Uh, I want him to be humble. Um, and mainly a good citizen. He said, they're the four values that I try to pride myself on the most and what I feel I'm bringing to Wakefield Trinity. I don't want anyone coming through our system to have them values, you know, embedded into them, which I'm really pleased to hear because uh, I think it's massively important you put the person first, you know, and not the player. I think if you understand the person, you can develop the player. And then my own philosophies in terms of, uh, the coaching side of it, if you take away the, the psychosocial and the, the mental attributes, is, um, is very much, I'd like to call it a bit organised chaos. Uh, I like players playing what they see. I don't like robots. I like them putting their own stamp on it. At the end of the day, we've all got our own unique skill set. I want them confident enough, especially in the youth leagues, to, to go out and show us, showcase their skills. Um, you know, but play collectively for the team. So it's getting that balance between a loose structure and then letting them play ad lib and getting that balance. So we do, we focus a lot on triggers, uh, you know, what triggers to play what you see. So you get a fast rook, you might get a big, big short side, you know, you might uh, get a spot in defence, a mismatch, a little versus large, you know, things like that. So it's just educating players to spot them little small advantages that they're going to get in a game and then give them the confidence and more importantly, the, the technical know-how, how to manipulate that space to their advantage. So I'm, you know, that's probably the best way I can describe my own personal philosophy and how I try to fit into what Wakefield Trinity want as a club. Brilliant. And that, well, that, that was going to be my next question, you know, pretty much. You know, what makes a good Wakefield player? And there you said, you know, being creative and those triggers, that playing DNA, you know, giving them a DNA and then letting them establish themselves within it, make their own decisions. Like, and like you said before, take that accountability themselves, you know, aware yeah. that you value. Yeah, that, that's massive, is that. And the end of the day, you know, what we what I think is not discussed enough, especially um, in sport, not just in rugby league, I think in general is, you know, these guys that we're uh, developing now, they're the future of the game. They're there to push the boundaries. If you watch, I don't know, let's use football, for example. I watched um, on Sky Sports, I think they were an old rerun. I think it was Man United versus... Uh, Juventus in a 1999, you know, when they went on to win that treble. And if you compare the, the actual standard then compared to what you see now in football, it's just unparalleled, isn't it? It's like what were classed as highly technical back then. It's pretty common knowledge for one of our, you know, one of the players now. And I think rugby league's very much similar. You know, that's not taken away from past generations. It's just natural progression. You know, you're always, you know, pushing boundaries and trying to, progress the game and I think we've got a massive responsibility to 
to let players play. I mean, how many times do we see in youth youth sport coaches coaching for themselves and not for the player? Um, you know, let them discover things, let them learn some harsh lessons. Sometimes, you know, if they if they want to play off a kickoff and they've knocked it on, then they'll learn what they're, they're all right. I either need to get more skillful or I don't need to do that play. You know, in consequence of that, is there is going to be a lot of errors in it. But eventually, you know, how we should be looking in, where's that player going to be in five, six years' time? If he practices that and he backs himself and he's confident enough to do it, all of a sudden, standard, you know, in Super League is you've got players that will play what they see and they're highly technical players that can execute what they're, what they're thinking at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think when you look at that, that sort of, that brand and that approach to it, and, you know, we're very much the same mindset, myself and Danny as well, I think that sort of exciting brand of rugby league is going to come out in the years to come because the players yeah. have got that bandwidth where they can play and they're making decisions like, say, not being robots. And, and yeah. take an example from, you know, one of the first games back the other, the other day with, with Hulk Air playing, you know, against uh, Warrington. Yeah. You know, trying something new from the start. And if anything, it's sort of highlighted that the game... Because it was so, so different. I even think the commentators struggled to, to actually decipher what was going on or think yeah. of you know, positives. It was always, well, you know, they're playing this way, but it's going to have repercussions later on. Well, if everyone starts playing that exciting brand, you know, rugby league, it's going to open up to a new um, host of fans, I'd, I'd imagine, as well. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's definitely one of rugby league as a, as a sport, uh, well, in our opinion, obviously, because we're involved in it, but it's, it's, it's good for the eye, isn't it? It's very exciting, it's very explosive, and uh, I once got really it described to me, this is back when I was still playing as a youngster, and it stuck with me, it's like, uh, when you watch boxing, they always say styles makes fights, don't they? So you might have a real, a real good defensive fighter versus someone that's just all out attack, and you tune in, you buy the box office, because you want to see if that guy's defence could withstand that guy's attack. And rugby league's no different. You know, back when you used to watch it, you know, teams had their own their own DNA, their own style. It's like you tune in to watch St. Helens. You know they're going to ping a ball about. You know they're known as never say die. They're always going to keep on coming to you till end. Um, Wigan, they're known for being real ruthless in defence and real tough. And you used to love watching them games. Can Saints flamboyant attack um, handle Wigan's, you know, tough defence? And I think when teams start getting their own identity back and they're not not all playing the same stuff, which they're not now, I'm, I'm just being very generalised here. And it's like, oh, we're playing, you know, Wakefield this week. We know that they're known for X, Y, Z. Or we're playing Warrington this week where, you know, they're known for X, Y, Z. All of a sudden, you get that you get that excitement back in the sport. And, you know, that that's, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, what do you, so off the back of that, what do you feel is the biggest barriers to elite talent development at the minute? In rugby league or in general? Um, we'll, we'll say rugby league, but you can broaden it to, to general. Um, I think complexity sometimes. I think people can overcomplicate things. Um, you know, keep things simple. If something's simple and it works in terms of the talent, you don't always have to come up with a robust system and a, a complex system to justify it. Um, you know, in saying that, the the, the opposite of that is you do need some systems in place and they have got to be robust. But once you've got things that work for you in particular in your club and, and yourself, make sure that everyone's accountable to them systems and you can measure performance on them systems. Like We focus heavily on, on three pillars. So we have this technical and tactical pillar, as athletic development pillar and as a psychosocial pillar. And then we can measure uh, scholarship, academy and reserves when it when it's back. We can measure how we perceive a, a kid to be at that moment in time compared to where we expect them to be. Um, so I think I think that's a big one. Uh, we've obviously got financial restraints uh, even before you know coronavirus hit, and we've we've got all these challenges that we're facing now. I think. Uh, rugby league as a sport in general, um, in terms of money that's getting pumped into youth development, probably could do a bit more. Uh, not one club in particular, I mean, as a collective there, I think it would be massive. But then again, you've got all arguments. Do you need as many academies in such a close-knit area? Do you have more regional academies? Uh, then just let a club have a reserve and a first team and then... If you want a, a kid out of an academy, you've got to draft them. You know, there's loads of arguments on that going on at the moment. I think that's got some legs in it. Um, 
And I think one of the main ones, to be honest, um, relationships, you know, be honest with each other, whether that's coach to board, board to coach, coach to coach, coach to player, player to player. I think you've got to be real brutally honest with each other. And if something's not working, you need to be strong enough in yourself as a person to to tell whoever it is, whether that's your, your board that you've got to justify a decision to or a player that that's not quite doing what you want or they are doing what you want. And you've got to make sure that player feels empowered enough to, to, to be able to tell you what they want because they're the main product of it all, aren't they? It's got to be player-centred. They've got to they've got to feel that they're in the right environment for, for themselves because, you know, that's what it's all about is developing them. You know, talent ID and talent development, it's all about prediction of future performance, isn't it? So they are the centre of that performance. I was going to grab that, the player player thing there, and be, being honest. Um, and that's something we've worked really kind of close on in, in the past is trying to empower players to, to feel that they're very much part of that development process as what you might class your, your leadership team within that. And you, you want them players to speak up. There's certain ways that we went, went around it um, and certain aspects of the week that was dedicated to almost the players being able to talk and open up. And yeah. It, it can stink, you know, at one point in particular, it was all of me. If I was five minutes late, boom, it'd be on me. If I was waiting around, kick, boom, it'd be on me. He's not with us anymore. <laughs> He's not dead. <laughs> no, he, he is a, a very good player and, and, and you want players like that to lead that environment so everybody feels that they can contribute to, to that to that individual. Evidence. How do you go about that at Wakefield to make sure that they do feel they can be honest without getting a leg blown off, if you like? Yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's building relationships. Um, I think that's key to coaching, if I'm perfectly honest with you, Danny. It's building relationships. I think when someone trusts you, they'll open up to you. Um, they might not always like what you're going to say to them, but if you if you trust them and you value their opinion, you, you know, you'll take it on board, won't you? I mean, just going on to that point, you said we, um, you know, as you'd expect in professional environments, you know, being punched, is pretty much standard and when you get some of these kids that I mean it's mainly when we get them from scholarship into academy and we tell the parents we give them you know look you know because when they're under 16 obviously parents are massively involved um, when they get over 16 we're like look we're not saying we don't want you involved because you're still an important part but we want them to start standing on their own two feet a little bit so we're going to start portray messages straight to them and we're going to start holding them a bit more accountable and you talk about you know if Jim starts at 7.30 or morning we expect you there at you know 7.15 at latest and that so you give yourself 15 minutes and then <laughs> if you rock up one minute late so you might get there at 7.16 I guarantee you there's at least 10 of them just there with a smile on the face just going what time's this match what time's this and you're just like hey look you know you've got to hold yourself as accountable as them haven't you so yeah Absolutely. it's uh, it's and, pretty and I funny think, when they get like that. I think their errors of being late yourself, sometimes if you do that on purpose, it almost makes them realise that you're human as well and, and it, it helps build that relationship, especially if you hold yourself accountable and carry out what you might feel as a consequence for being late, whether it's, I don't know, if you have to do 5K on a roller or, or stay late, whatever it is, if you can do what they're supposed to do as well, it helps going back to that relationship where they go, I can trust this guy because he's not just authoritarian who's going to tell me to do something and not do it yourself. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, we've tried uh, going on to that that thing about taking control of your own futures. We've, we we tried to come up with them to come up with, right, what do you want your punishments to be if, if you, you know, fall short of our standards or whatever? Um, <laughs> and when we first brought it in, there were a dice rolling, you know, just through little forfeits. You might have to sing in front of a group. You know, one of them might be, right, you're going to get a a five quid fine, you know, whatever it is, the five quid fine and then go back to the players somehow, you know, they've got to buy something for them. But yeah, we've got to be careful. You just got to make sure you police it right because all of a sudden it went from little things like that to we had guys with bleach blonde there, no hair whatsoever, no eyebrows and all that. All right, lads, look, just because someone's two minutes late, it doesn't mean they're going to be walking around with no eyebrows for two weeks or whatever <laughs> it takes for them to grow back. But you are right there. It's, you know, it's just getting that balance right of you don't want, um, you know, the humans at the end of the day and the learning, they're going to make mistakes. Uh, sometimes there's going to be stuff going on away from rugby that, you know, that might affect how they are when they're in your company. Um, and it's important to feel, 
uh, strong enough uh, to be able to open up to you and tell you and you don't just come down on them like a, a ton of bricks all the time just because they're a couple of minutes late because you know we've all been there and we all know that sometimes you've got stuff happening and you can't help it do you yeah I think that's the real good thing about our our role in talent development is you'd like to think we're given the the kind of blank canvas just to develop that person and the player. You're not in that first team environment, whereas if you don't win four games on the balance of the head coach, you, you potentially lose your livelihood. Yeah. Our role is to be able to give them a, enough of a player to stand up to then be able to do what the head coach wants. And, you know, you, you can spend a lot of time on psychosocial and, and what's happening in the background. So it gives you a real good bandwidth, like Rob touched on, to really develop that player. I think it's exciting for us. Yeah. I think, I think, you guys at all, you, I mean, I've obviously seen your systems because I work with you on, on a few things and I think it's a, a real good, robust system you guys have got and I think it's evident in in what, what Hull are now seeing coming through. I mean, every time we play you in, in the uh, academy and reserves, they're, they're always good games and then you're now seeing, you know, fruition of your work going on and, and kicking on to the first team, are you? And it's, it's pleasing to see, mate, very pleasing to see. I yeah, appreciate you saying that. We, we speak a lot when you come to Wakefield, you always know you're going to get that right level of challenge. It's always tough, physical and, and competitive. And I was going to touch on this earlier and, and, and when you said about let players make mistakes and let them play what they see and stuff, a lot of people would say that's what they believe in. And as a coach, when you, especially in 18s, when there's a, a league structure, if you like, oh. to go out there as a coach and probably not talk throughout the game, not give too much feedback and let them play. Rob finds this really hard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if, if like Rob won't stand next to me, if he's coaching, um, he won't stand next to me because I'm, I find that real hard. I want to do that. That is my philosophy. I go, right, I'm not going to speak because the players can learn. It's difficult for me not to say to Rob, tell him this. It's good to have Rob as a, as a, as a buffer because he won't. How do you yeah. get around that? Or are you just happy to sit relaxed because I know you're a real relaxed bloke. No, I'm not. I'm a booming. I'd be classed as uh, hothead on match days. I've tried going more the the football approach now. I just like standing. I like the atmosphere. I don't know why. I think even if I I went on and coached uh, uh, Super League, I'd want to stand on sideline. Um, I just want to. I like that that atmosphere of it. But it's a real massive point you've said there about the league structure, and I think we can all say we've being found guilty of it at times. I definitely was when I first started coming, you were like, oh yeah, we can just build little mini-me's and, you know, we can just pass on what we already know and um, they won't make their mistakes then and then they'll win, they'll beat this team. And they, yeah, they might win the game, but they're not learning anything. Uh, they're not learning from their mistakes. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying one way is right, one way is wrong. My own personal view is, I mean, you hear teams doing previews every week on academy games about opposition they're playing or even in under 16s and I just I cry a little bit inside I'm like just let them go out and figure it out for themselves I mean I can understand one or two weeks right a year you give them a test uh, right this in a performance environment you are going to preview a team and you're going to work on these things but this is just my own personal philosophy youth development should be all about just giving them some basic key points, you know, and then just letting them go out and show you what they can do. You know, here's a loose structure for you to follow, lads. These are triggers that we're telling you about. Go see if you can manipulate them and, and show us what you can do. I want to be excited watching games. I, you know, I want to see people pushing boundaries and, and pushing things to the next level and changing how the game's played because that that's what next level of sport's all about. And, you know, in 10 years' time, they're going to be drawing it, aren't they? So you want them... I'm going to give him a license to do it now at a young age. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You said it's in your time. You touched on it earlier with football and the level of performance now compared to when you were 30 in 99. To what it's like <laughs> is, is that when it comes to identifying the right talent from a young age, like we have to do in rugby league now to know maybe 13 years of age. How hard is that? And how do you manage that risk? Uh, I think it's... I think it's Hard, definitely. I mean, I think we touched on talent ID, didn't we? We said it was, um, you know, it's an indicator of future performance. And rugby league, in its very essence, is a late development sport. I mean, I know you two know we. I think it's 
madness that we put so much emphasis on the 13 and 14 age group. Um, if anything, we've just got rid of the most important age group in terms of development, which is reserve grade rugby. Um, you know, I can't work that one out from a talent development point of view. But yeah, in terms of that, I mean, I'll give you two players just from our club and I'm sure every club could do the same. I think Tom Johnson, uh, he signed second year academy. Uh, Stu Dickens was coach at the time and um, he tells me when he first got him he was just gangly you know he could tell he had athletic potential but he definitely wouldn't have thought he'd develop and, and go on as quick as he has to what he has gone on to but you know 17 I think they got him James Batchelor um, he joined our college programme I remember you know we coached his brother Joe me and Fordy and then James came, so obviously we knew his brother, so we were all bachelor. He wasn't on any systems whatsoever. And after four or five weeks, I was like, how the hell has no one picked this kid up? And I rang Raz Hudson, who were head of youth at Wakefield at the time, and I said, oh, man, I've, there aren't a few injuries at the time. He goes, have you got any kids that you think can can play academy rugby? I said, man, I've just found the kid that I think probably going to be your best player. And he was like laughing with me, going, no, 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 but no, you aren't. And then he came down, and I think after it must have been two months, he'd been signed up, toured England, uh, toured Australia with England Academy, and then signed up on a five year deal or whatever it is the club offered him. And I mean, both players there, we got 18, we missed him through a scholarship. Um, so it's not as easy as what people see. Um, a lot of people go for obvious talent. You know, we can all go to an under-14s game or you get reports off your scouts and they're like, oh, this kid's killing it and he might have scored five tries. He might be five stone heavier than the rest of them or whatever. There's your obvious talent. It's them kids that are standing out. You know, the ones with that athletic potential that where they're going to be in five years' time, that's all I ever ask our, our talent ID team because where, where do you perceive them to be in five years' time? And when we've got that list then... Um, Staffing-wise, it can be an issue, you know, as I said, going back to constraints of it. But, um, you know, trying to minimise that risk. So that's one way you do it. And then again, going back to your systems, I know you've got a real robust system there. Um, you know, is the player right fit for your club? You know, your club wants certain types of player and that. Is he going to be a right fit? So then you put him into your system, you do your testing, you do your checks, and then you've got to give them time. You know, you've got to back your coaching staff. You've got to back the player and back your environment and, you know, try and nurture them through what is a, a tricky time in their life. You know, they haven't just got rugby league, they've got the schooling, their exams, you know, they've got all the social circles that they're involved in. Uh, they discover women, uh, they discover other things. You know, how many players do we all know that, that you can say coming through at ranks are going to be next, next big thing and then all of a sudden they've just dropped off radar for, you know, whatever reason it is. So it's not a... You know, everyone goes on about the rocky road, but you've got to allow kids to travel that rocky road. You can't just spoon feed them it. You know, you've got to let them have real life mishaps and then you've got to be there to, you know, catch them if they need it and be strong enough in your yourself and in your team to be able to nurture that kid onto where you want them to go. So it's not easy at all. I think you just nailed that with the catch them if they need it, that support. Yeah. You would kind of encourage challenge. They can find it like in life, like you said, but having a support network to, to catch them, to take your foot off the head if they're drowning, that type of thing. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's a great kind of mantra to go down. Just, you, you're clearly nailing your philosophy there at Wakefield. And, and like Rob said, you know, we're very of, of, of similar minds. You know, you went to uni, you graduated there. What just for people that might be listening to this, you, you're a well-read individual. Uh, can you yeah. give us some like, books or examples, even if it's experiences that have helped shape you as a coach? Uh, well, I've started some books. Um, yeah, I like reading. I think, I think most of us do, though. With uh, Books in terms of coaching. Uh, I remember one of the first books I read were after England won 2003 World Cup, Rugby Union. And Clive Woodward brought out his book called Winning. And I first remembered reading that, and, and don't get me wrong, he, uh, he turned winning into a business, so to speak. And it did trigger some thoughts in my head. Obviously, I was still pretty young myself and all a bit, bit naive to some of it, but it definitely got me thinking along different walks of line. Um, Phil Jackson, uh, famous basketball coach, 11 Rings, that's a real good 
good book. I mean, when you look at what he's done, he managed to my Chicago Bulls, obviously, when they had Jordan, uh, Pippen and, and Rodman and that. How do you manage egos? How do you get players like that to perform? I mean, you look at Dennis Rodman, you know, he needed a bit of time to let, let his steam out, shall we say. You've got Jordan, who's that ruthless uh, winner, just work ethic, you know, expects a certain standard off everyone. Then you've got Pippen that's, uh, you know, your support act that every team needs them three types. I think I was listening to Eddie Jones on about it the other day. And, you know, how do you manage that? How do you manage that as a team? How do you coach it? And it was interesting reading that book about how he did it at Chicago, then he did it again at, at LA. Um, and then Bill Walsh, the score takes care of itself. You know, that, that's a real good book. He's real massive on, on humans and uh, connection, human connection. So I found them three books especially. Uh, in terms of coaching, really uh, useful. Uh, I'm reading a book. I read a book, should I say, while I was on furlough, James Kerr, uh, Legacy. That goes on about the All Blacks and their philosophy. So there were some real good lessons in leadership off that. And then my latest book I'm reading is by a guy called Ross Edgley. And he's called The Art of Resilience. He just swam around the UK. I think he's got UK record or, or whatever it is for doing that or he's the only guy to do it and um, he just goes on about you know the mental skill set you need and he's it's a really good read I think just for both coaches and aspiring players about how to build a bit of uh, resilience and, and belief in yourself so that I'd say they're the books that have definitely left a massive impression on me anyhow. I think you can see that in what you're talking. Big messages, interpersonal skills, relationships and characters, you know, in terms of that, good people, if you mm -hmm. like. And you, you obviously, you, you've watched um, The Last Dance as well. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you get, when you're creating a culture where it's like, look, fellas, if we want discipline, we want this. How do you get the other team to understand and buy into you when letting Davis Rodman go to Vegas for a week? <laughs> oh, how do you? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm conscious to say to the we are by far from uh, perfect to work through. We've got a hell of a lot we need to work on. I've got a hell of a lot I need to work on. It's about creating that culture. But yeah, how, how would you manage that? You know, you've just got a player that buggers off for two, three days. And when you ring up, where is it? I was in Vegas partying. You're like, oh, well, yeah, how do you do with it? I think Jordan flew out, didn't he? And uh, he flew out and went and got him. I mean, imagine that as a teammate. You've got someone that's hell-bent on winning. And they know that they need that cog in their team to be able to win, that you actually get on a private jet, fly out to Vegas and literally drag him back to training so that he's ready to perform. Massive. Absolutely huge. Like you say, it's it's managing that the, that dressing room, you know, and, and ultimately, like you're saying there, they manage it themselves, really. Yeah. You know, and, and Phil Jack, he mentions it, doesn't it, within the book. And, yeah. And I think there's some, some, outstanding, um, some outstanding reads in there for people. Um, just sort of taking that further, going back to, to coaching and how like coaching shapes you, who are the co best coaches that you've worked with that have really shaped your career? Uh, I've got to say my, my main community coaches. Um, I didn't start playing rugby until I was 14. Uh, I've been playing football. And uh, I, I had one, one year at East Moor, then I moved to Stanley Rangers because all my schoolmates were at Stanley Rangers and they had a really good team. Um, our last year as a, as a group, uh, you know, I think it were under 18s, yeah, under set because you could play both then. You could play your community and, and you could still play, you know, in summer season for, you know, for Wakefield. And we had a real good under 18s team at Stanley and my coach is there, so I had Jez King, um, Charlie Might and, and and Keith Walker. They they just taught me about self belief and letting us play. Um, they didn't put a massive structure in us. They just let us go out and enjoy yourself. And we played with smiles on our face, and we we just enjoyed being there. So they they definitely left an impression on me on that and how much they cared for us. Uh, J.K. So John Keir, he wore. You know, he used to make you think you could go out and rip a lion's head off. Uh, probably best motivational coach I've ever had. You know, you could be the worst team in the world, but five minutes before kickoff, you were going out there with enough uh, self-belief that you could, you'd feel like you could beat anyone. Um, 
So yeah, he will, he will probably the best motivational coach of all. And to, um, to do it consistently, consistently, mm-hmm. yeah, like the, the cups is won and things like that, and to, that is on the back of that to keep being able to inspire people at, to that level. What a great gift that! Oh, he's unbelievable, mate. He's uh, I mean, I had JK for about what in total I think five five six years of my career. You know, at Wakefield for a year got rid of me actually. Cheers for that, mate. And. Um, hmm. And then when I came back from Australia, he signed me at, at Batley. Um, but again, yeah, you respected him because he was honest with you. Uh, when he got rid of me, he told me why he got rid of me. And, um, you know, he... Well, yeah, he <laughs> got rid of you for this part. But, um, you know, you respected him because he was honest with you for it. But, yeah, motivationally, I've never met a more passionate guy about rugby league than JK. And he just, just loves the game. Um you know, and as I said, you'd run through brick walls for him. And then another coach that left a massive impression on me was Shane McNally, my first ever Super League coach. He was coach at Wakefield when I was first got into the team. And um, he just helped me as a person as much as he did a player. He, he credited, yeah, I credit him for loads of things, but just making me understand myself and, and becoming more mature and actually taking responsibility and things like that. He put a massive emphasis on that. So I'd probably say them three uh, were definitely in different aspects. You know, I've learned something from all of them there. But it's obviously like working for you, you know, finding yourself now within the England role as well. You know, what's the biggest thing, things you've, you've learned whilst you've been in that role? No, it's been great. Uh, the, the England stuff, um, I think there's a real good setup at the moment. I really do. And I think I think there's some real good stuff happening. I mean, the EPU, the English Performance Unit, when I first came in, Danny was the under 16 head. Uh, and I came in to assist him, um, you know, along with Ant Afferton and, and Scully does all age groups here with him, and Paul Anderson. And there's just some real good people involved. And as you expect, it's England. You're after what is perceived to be the best talent at that time in their careers and it's good to see how many good talented young players is coming through our game but not only good players good people um, you know so it's been really enjoyable there it challenges you um, in different ways it was good assisting Danny he challenged me in this um, different ways of coaching as well helps you develop as a person um, it takes you out of your comfort zone for sure uh, but it was good going back to under 16s as well, and you know, and then revisiting that. But then it's there's enough smart people there to understand they are under 16, you know, and what the focus should be at that. And then obviously when they go to academy, they've they've got a different focus, but they've just done real well, haven't they, with that team beating the Aussie schoolboys and whatnot. And um, we're showing Wayne back in control at at first team. Um, you know, I think there's some real exciting times ahead for England. So, yeah, I'm glad I'm involved in it, to be honest. The thing on that, Mark, it gives you, it said it did with, with, with me, is to, when you go back to your own environment, you, you can kind of compare where players that maybe aren't in that system, that maybe you feel should be, understandably yeah. why they're not, but should be. And you can kind of start using that to drive their ambition as well, if you like, um, from a player development point of view. No, 100%, mate. It's, um, it's pleasing, isn't it, to see when you do go back to your own environment and you see some kids that are naturally disappointed that, you know, they've not been selected for whatever reason. Um, but that's all it is. It's uh, a coach's opinion or a group's opinion. And that, that's what we are. And I'm very keen to stress to them all, look, this, if, if we do promote a kid or, you know, you have got to let kids go, I'm like, don't give up on your dream. It is just our opinion. There'll be no one more happy that if you prove us wrong than me, you know, but our job is to make uh, decisions and opinions on kids. So when you see, um, you know, at England, what is the elite at that age group? Um, there's a lot of kids that, that are unlucky, isn't there, they're not to get there and they're not far off. So it's good when you can go back and tell them, look, you are, you're not far off what, is perceived to be the best talent in this country at this moment in time. Absolutely. With you being big on relationships, the difference between short-term coaching, which might be England, you get maybe one day a month or one day a week until the camp. How do you go about building them relationships quickly? Uh, I think I learned a lot of you there, if I'm honest, mate. Um, you know, when I first came into, into England, I think we had 
uh, four one day, one Saturday afternoon, morning afternoon sessions. Then we went straight over to France, didn't we? Um, and how you went about that? Oh, I forget that. Oh, Could you try? Series just picks up on some. <laughs> yeah, how you went about uh, putting them into small groups, setting them fun little tasks. You know, uh, getting people to speak in front of groups so that they get that confidence in themselves. Um, mixing the groups up so you can assess who the leaders are. And then just little interpersonal things like that. So I definitely learned a lot of yourself in that. Um, it's different, but it's challenging at the same time. You know, when they get to that level, um, they're testing themselves, aren't they, against, you know, other nations that they're perceived best talent. So it's a different a different form of coaching to how you go about your development coaching in your, your club setup, isn't it? Well, thanks for the kind words there, personally. But yeah, I, I agree. It's different. Yeah, so a question that we've been asking everyone, especially with, um, coaches that we've we've had on here, is yeah. sort of that best drill or coaching activity that you've done. We've we've all got one that you go to, you know, where you know, you've got a group of kids in front of you and you need to uh, put a session on. What is the one that you enjoy delivering or your players enjoy you delivering most? Well, what I enjoy delivering and what the players all say is the <laughs> best are two different things. Um, I like a bit of contact. I, I, I do like a bit of contact, so I, I like watching. Uh, we got a couple of drills, one called the uh, St George drill. I do like just watching kids ramp into each other and and get that aggression up. But I think I think the best one uh, are definitely constraints games. You know, small sided games. Um, isolate a skill that you've been working on on an acquisition phase or whatever. Put it into a game. You know, just watch kids learn and put their own spin on that skill and, and push the boundaries of it. And then you'll learn as much from them as, as they've probably learned from you. Um, so I'm massive on every Friday, we'll try to put a game on it of some sort. You know, everyone likes playing games, don't they? So we'll normally um, put a drill on, as I say, it might be skill acquisition. So you've got, it's important they understand that skill first and they can actually execute that skill. But once they've got a basic understanding and execution of that skill, Put them in a game. So, for example, if you're working on offloading, you know, teach them different types of offloads. You know, are you going through the line and getting an offload? Are you hitting and spinning and getting an offload? Are you falling to ground and getting an offload? Out the back door, around the back, you name it. And once they've got them, put them into games, right? You can only do X offloads. You can only do this. And I guarantee you, any coach watching, you will learn something from your kids because they'll execute a form of offload that you've not even thought about. And it's, it's so good to watch. So I'd say constraints games, small sided games, definitely isolating a you know a specific skill, so to speak. Fantastic, love that. If you could ask any coach or player, past yeah. or present, any question, and you could, I'll open it up to any sport. What would it be? Why, apart from the John Q, why do you get ready? Because you know that because you're Mister. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. He told me about ten times, and he <laughs> takes great joy in. <laughs> Telling me still. Um, any sport, well, I'll go away from rugby league just to make it interesting. Um, I don't know, I'd love to ask Jordan, uh, you know, just what. Katie Price. <laughs> Do you want me? Katie Price. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> no, yeah, I'd, I'd love to ask Michael Jordan some questions, but definitely what, what his biggest fears were. Because the, the guy was just bulletproof, wasn't he? Just how he came back from things. I mean, he was definitely a childhood hero of mine, but I'm sure he was for a load of people. I'd love to ask Johnny Wilkinson questions. You know, his, his mindset and his dedication to his craft uh, when he was at his peak was unbelievable. So I'd, just, I'd actually want to ask him how much he enjoyed what he actually did because I know he, he's come out after his career and said that, um, he did suffer a bit with anxiety and things like that. So I'd love to ask him what, what he was actually thinking at key moments, key games, you know, when he won a World Cup or things like that. Uh, from a coaching point of view, yeah, just a lot of NFL coaches I'd love to chat to just about how they actually go about managing the teams that they do and that amount of players and how, how they go about building teams and making sure that they've got 80 odd players that all know each other and and can work towards a common goal and things like that. So then, you know, any any like that. But if I had one, it'd be Michael Jordan. Outstanding. Before Rob wraps up, 
I know this has come to the end now. I just want to thank you for your time. The answers have been outstanding. Certainly give me something to go and think about. And I know it will have people listen to this. So cheers, Mark. I'll pass on to Rob to close. Yeah, no, exactly. Thanks for me on. Exactly the same. You know, like I say, thanks for your time. I think everything that you've said has been has been great. I think, like you say, I think there's plenty that coaches and players alike can both take out of it. Um, it's been enjoyable and it's been good to catch up during this sort of strange time as well. So, well, we should have played you a couple of times. So, yeah, Cheers. well, yeah. No, for, thanks for having us on, and um, you know, it's really pleasing to see you two doing this and, and other shows getting getting into fruition now. And uh, hopefully, I'll catch up with you both in person soon. No worries. Cheers, Matt. Cheers, Matt. Take care. Right, cheers, boys.